And you had a, a, a workforce of about 50,000 people um, at the Met. So how did you go about communicating with such a huge, huge workforce? Well, for me, leadership is about communication. I think you know, everybody's got their own definitions of leadership. I'm not saying mine is the only one, but I think if you're a leader, then apart from what you might contribute with ideas and various things, I think your, your duty, your, your whole reason for being there is to be able to communicate, mm-hmm. to listen, um, and then to share ideas. And if you're not heard, then you're not influencing people. And if you're not influencing people, you're not leading. So for me, the communication bit is vital. And I always wanted to look at my own leaders and my own diary. Because if you are communicating with the people you lead, it will be in your diary. Um, it's a vital part of that working day. So, I mean, for me, every well, every day I met my own team, but then every uh, 28 days I met the top 100, uh, which was for half a day. Mm-hmm. Uh, every 12 weeks I met the top 1,500. Um, now, that is something which we did in Merseyside. We said, said at first in the Met, you can't do. And I said, well, we are doing it. We can decide how, but not whether. And that was to meet all the sergeants and above, which when I arrived in the Met was about 11,500. So we met those people every, well, once a year in groups of 500. I won't bore you with what we did, but the idea was to meet, you know, at some point face-to-face to to share ideas and hopefully that they were reassured by some of the things you were thinking about, or at least they hopefully were reassured that your passions were in the same same direction as theirs were. And I think that's one thing that's vital in in a crisis is you don't veer away from your mission or your values. You know, you've got a mission and it may be disrupted by a, a crisis, but I think you're foolish to ignore it and not take any opportunity a crisis presents. Crises are awful things. People die, as we're seeing in this present one. But mm. you should never waste the opportunity a crisis presents. Um, and I well, think they, say, they say that the, um, you know, a crisis exposes the character of an organization it doesn't make it and as you say those those values as, that you have as uh, an organization and the mission you know, they should be what help you really get through these these um, very difficult and often the very sensitive times yeah well i think sometimes people think that you know this about mission and values thing is all a bit woolly and all a bit airy fairy mm. is that if you make you know if you my only guidance to our organization was i don't want any more than four you know i don't want a huge list that we can't remember and I mm-hmm. want a list of things that we can look each other in the eye and say, that's us. So, yep. you know, I mean, our four in policing, in both Merseyside and in the Met, and I didn't create them. The, the organization created them. Integrity, uh, courage, which is moral and physical, uh, professionalism, and care. Sometimes people look a bit oddly when you hear a police force saying about care, but it was about caring for each other. It's mm-hmm. a three o'clock in the morning, you only had each other to rely on. You can't ring the police, you're it. Um, and secondly, if you care for each other, then perhaps you might just care a bit better for the people we provide the service for. So they they were they have to be our values, but they come under real strain in a in a crisis. Um, mm-hmm. But I think if you are true to them, uh, you'll always come out of it stronger. Mm. And how do you monitor for the performance of those people? I think well, certainly I've, I've always been a very keen performance animal. Really, that you know I, I want to know that we're doing good things in the right order. Not you know not in a pedantic or a robotic way but you know, once you've decided that these are the things that you do to solve burglary then not a bad idea to do them really you know if you if you looked at detecting crime there's only three ways to do it you either catch them doing it you use forensic evidence to link the person to the crime or someone tells you who did it and the vast majority <laughs> someone tells you who did it really but each of those buckets you can fill very well if you do things in the right order you know if you get to a robbery scene quickly um, you might catch somebody nearby who's committed a robbery. If you search the exit scene for where the robber ran, you might find the handbag that they threw away because they only wanted the credit card. Um, these are things that you could do methodically and well. Um, and those are things that are worth checking. Um, and you know you, how you deal with people in custody, all these are vitally important things uh, if, if done well. And you might only do them 80% of the time. But if you did them 80%, not 40%, that's twice as much. So I've always sort of had that mindset, not to be a pedant, but to say, mm-hmm. you know, once we agree that these are things that work, let's just keep doing them. When we create a new list, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. But I think that also is true in a crisis. Um, first of all, that the routine things are done. Often in crises, people don't get the contingency plan out. Mm-hmm. That's says, very true. You know, people take years to write these things, and they're usually born of some awful disaster that's happened in an organisation. And some poor soul had to write it. Mm-hmm. And we've all learned it. And then a crisis mm-hmm. comes in, it sits on the shelf. 
So what I've always insisted is you get the staff officer or someone said, pick it off the shelf, read it. And when we go wrong or we need to know something that somebody made a mistake with before, just shout. Because these yeah. are big things quite often. So and I think, I think that's quite important. And they do the, well, people will do the contingency plans, but they won't necessarily have the communication side built into it. And they don't always do sort of fire drills to test them. Um, and that's a disaster, as I'm sure you'll, you'll confirm. Yeah, I think one of the benefits for a, an emergency organisation is that you are often testing your contingency plans and you've got people in an operational dynamic. Mm -hmm. you know, of manufacturers, you know, people who produce cars have got an operational dynamic. I'm not saying you know, they're capable, very good people. But the, 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 the emergency services are testing these things regularly and their leaders and got systems yeah. to support it. I suppose the question is for other organisations, if you don't work at that pace all the time, you've got mm -hmm. a fairly control of parameters of your operation, but how do you adapt when it, it moves you know, to a different uh, pace? And, you know, but the, some of the old things still work. You know, when you remember I mentioned about these structured meetings that we'd have in the morning and the yeah. evening, you know, still follow up on actions works. You know, I've seen meetings in crises where people spend the first 15 minutes talking about the storyboard. And then somebody says right at the end, well, somebody will sort the actions out. No, <laughs> that's what you agreed about eight hours ago that you thought was really important. And yeah. there was some vital information there. And it may seem bureaucratic. It may seem administrative. But actually, that can be dealt with fairly quickly. But even if somebody says we don't know yet, that's an answer. Yeah. Well, it's not okay, so we haven't looked. <laughs> and that's, that's interesting in terms of delegation then, in terms of the, the continuity then between, as you mentioned, you can't be on 24-7 yourself and you have to have a stunt double in that situation. So um, making sure that all the sort of notes and the reporting is meticulous is, is one of the key things. But maybe you just talk a little bit about how you um, manage delegation and um, in, in, in a crisis situation. Well, first of all, you, you know, you've got to be invested to a large extent. You can still recover in a crisis, but you've got to, I think, you have to have invested in a few things before the crisis. So one is selecting cadres of people to do certain roles. So in the police, you know, a superintendent is a middle manager. Um, and, well, let's say, take a chief superintendent, he's a middle manager. And in the size of the command units in London now, could be managing about 1,500 people, looking after your know, population uh, approaching a million people. These are big jobs. Um, but on top of that, you might ask them to have a shadow role. So some of them might be firearms commanders. Some of them might be hostage negotiators. Some of them might get involved in kidnap operation. So there aren't enough of these things that happen all the time, that that's a full-time job. You, so you expect them to carry a second burden. So to ask them to do that, you've got to select them in the first place. Not all chief supers are good at firearms jobs. There's some mm -hmm. are very good, but not all are. So you have to select the right ones. You've got to train them. You have to exercise with them. So even if they don't have a firearms operation for six months, that you need to exercise in between. Um, and then you need to keep their skills up. You need to accredit them and you just make sure that they're keeping up to date with all the stuff that's happening. Now, if you put that investment in before, when you get to the crisis, you've got a cadre of people who you are sure, as anybody can be, that these are able people, well-trained, well-led, got the kit in they know who they're working with, and now the operation should smoothly kick in. Never quite works like that. There's always going to be you know, glitches and no, nothing's perfect. Um, sure. But in very high risk uh, situations where you've got to get it right more often than you get it wrong, then I think these investments are wise before the event. So then you can, you know, you can go into these uh, events with a, a confidence that you wouldn't have if you're having to learn on the job. Yeah, absolutely. And what's your advice on boosting uh, morale and sort of solidarity uh, in times of a crisis? Well, I think, first of all, I think, you know, just the leaders that can play a part. I know in this present crisis, you know, we have said that we, you know, we can't meet. Well, that's not the same as saying you can't be in the same room face to face. I mean, many organisations are still working face to face. You, you know, you, you can see mm -hmm. around many organisations are still working from an office or from, a, you know, banks are clearly still working. Uh, you've got <clears throat> your manufacturers who are still producing things. We need to produce PPE. You know, there's lots of things that have, have got to still happen. So this seems to me to be a great time for leaders to get around and meet their people. You don't Absolutely. have to be within two meters. But, you know, yeah. just to, because they will give you stuff. I mean, some of my best ideas have been from the people I lead. You know, they've been, if, you know, when you've got the chance to meet, they will say, why don't we do this? Or why can't we stop doing that? 
And the best ideas, of course, are when somebody doesn't only complain about something, but gives you something constructive to do with it. <laughs> and I think if you're around them, they will tell you stuff that you need to know. And they will always remember the fact that you turned up. And Absolutely. I think secondly, if there's a, it's some mind things that you can do. This is just a silly example, but I mean, not to go carnival, I mentioned, I went every year to that because there were 7,000 of our staff after 50,000. So every year I used to go into the feeding tent and wander the route because you just meet thousands of your own people. And they knew you were there. Um, mm -hmm. You'd find out that the care staff had been there since four o'clock in the morning. Uh, we're working in incredibly hot conditions and we were paying them a pittance. But you got, they got a right for you to understand a little of what their experience was. And if they had an idea, you could do something about it. I think you know, some years it actually, well, some years it threw it down with rain, not a gill, but some years it was just very hot. So you could make sure they got some ice cream. It costs you nothing. It's a very minor thing, and some people might not like ice cream. But at least you were there, at least you understood a little of their experience. If they got an idea, you could do something. I think it's the great joy of leadership is that when yeah. somebody has a problem, you've got the power to sort it out. They might say, there's a huge bureaucracy, I can't buy this, I can't do that. Yes, you can. I'm telling you, we're doing it. And I think your leaders who are able, particularly in crisis, to get out there and see what's happening. It may not be a strategic intervention all the time, but it will matter to those people. Yeah, and it will always be remembered. Yeah, because I think you often you hear a lot, not only about the person you're talking to, but sometimes about the family. You know, it might be a child that's not well. Um, it could be a, a parent who's you know, going through some, some particular trauma. And maybe the, all you have to do is say, go home. You know, people come to work as a duty quite often because they feel as though they would be judged for not coming. But, you know, if you're in a position, so actually the best thing you could do for us is to be at home for as long as it takes. And that, I think that is a great opportunity. Other leaders should do it too. It's not only the leader. I think there are many other leaders who can do it. But I think if you mimic or you, you, you portray behaviours you want us to, to ex exemplify, then I think you've got a good chance of doing that. And I think in a crisis, people get very emotional. Uh, can get lose the temper fairly quickly and get frustrated. So I think to show some empathy and some humanity within that can, can be a vital part of, of taking your organisation through it.